In this video, I'm going to talk about a very interesting function of the kidney, namely its ability to produce a concentrated urine. Now, the regulation of plasma osmolality is an essential function that the kidney has to control. To preserve life, plasma osmolality has to be maintained within a very narrow range of about 285 to 295 milliosmoles per kilogram of water. We know that osmolality is simply the ratio of solutes to water in blood plasma. And we also know that the kidney has independent mechanisms to regulate water and sodium excretion. Now since electrolyte uh, levels are kept very stable, it means that osmolality is largely maintained by mechanisms that regulate body water content. And herein lies a potential problem for land animals. As you know, their access to water varies widely. To compensate for conditions of either water deficit or water loading, the kidney has the ability to produce either a diluted or a concentrated urine. In a manner of speaking, the osmolality of blood plasma is simply a measure of the hydration status of the animal. When there is an excess of water in the body and body fluid osmolality is reduced, the kidney can excrete a diluted urine with a high volume and osmolality as low as 50 milliosmoles per kilogram of water. On the other hand, when the animal is deprived of water, the kidney can conserve water by increasing the, osmol the osmolality of the urine to a level well above that of blood. In fact, the human kidney may produce a concentrated urine averaging about 1,200 milliosmoles per kilogram, which amazingly is about five times the osmolality of a normal extracellular fluid. It is this capability of producing either a dilute or a concentrated urine that is essential for the survival of mammals that live on land, including humans. Making the concentrated urine is mainly a It is sometimes surprising to a student to hear that the concentration of urine actually happens in the collecting duct of juxtamedullary nephrons. In a well hydrated animal, the late collecting duct and the collecting duct is impermeable to water. However, if the animal becomes dehydrated, has a high uh, plasma osmolality, it will activate osmoreceptors in the brain and elsewhere, and in turn this will cause the release of antidiuretic hormone or ADH, and it is also known as vasopressin. ADH stimulates the insertion of water channels or aquaporins into the cell membranes and the collecting duct becomes water permeable. Water is then driven by the osmotic gradient between the fluid of the collecting duct and the hypermolar osmolar interstitium, and this carries on until osmotic equilibrium has been reached. The end result is a urine which is concentrated and typically will have a very low volume. In summary, there are two major 
issues that you need to remember. First of all, concentration of urine will not happen in the absence of ADH. Without ADH present, the medullary interstitium has an osmolality of only approximately 600 milliosmoles per kilogram, and as a result, not as much water will be pulled from the collecting duct into the interstitium. This point is well demonstrated by a clinical condition. In renal disease, damage of the tubular cells will be caused and they become less responsive to ADH. This impairs the renal concentrating ability of the kidney, leading to a condition known as inadequately concentrated urine. It sometimes happens in animals with renal azotemia. The second determinant is the interstitial fluid hyperosmolality. This is critical. Uh, for example, even with aquaporins in place in the collecting uh, duct and with ADH pre uh, present, water will not be reabsorbed if the interstitial medullary has been washed out of solutes as happens, for example, with chronic severe polyuria. So this leaves us with a big question. How does medullary fluid become so hyperosmotic? This is a fairly complex question and I'll try to make it simple enough so that you may visualize all the processes that are involved. First of all, there is a mechanism or mechanisms known as countercurrent, which is, lies at the heart of making a hyperosmotic medullary interstitium. Now, a countercurrent flow happens if you have two closely opposed tubules and the flow runs in opposite directions in each. We have two types of countercurrent mechanisms, and it turns out that both of these will be functional in the kidney. The first is referred to as countercurrent exchange. Now, in countercurrent exchange, we will have the two tubules with flow in opposite directions, directions, and the tubules will be close enough to each other. The important issue is that the energy, which could be heat, or it could be iron concentrations, will flow from the one tubule to the other tubule passively. Exchange is passive. Another feature of a countercurrent exchange is that there'll only, since it's passive, only small gradients will be responsible for the exchange. And if you look at the input and output ports of a counter exchange mechanism, then you will see that there are only small differences. In this example, we have heat being transferred from one tubule into another. The difference is only three degrees of Celsius. On the other hand, we have a much more complex mechanism, which is referred to as a counter current multiplier. The big difference between a counter current multiplier and an exchanger is that the transfer of energy is going to be active. So, for example, if you want to have a counter current multiplication of iron concentrations, you're going to need pumps to pump the ions from one tubule into another. The continual pumping of, for example, ions, the recirculation of the salts, will cause large gradients, much larger than you can imagine happening with the countercurrent exchange mechanism. Also, there's going to be a much larger input, a, 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 a much larger difference between the input 
and output energies. For example, we will find that the input port in the kidney will have an osmolality of about 300 milliosmoles per kilogram, without, whereas the output flow will have an osmolality of only about 100 milliosmoles per kilogram. Now that we understand the major differences between a countercurrent exchanger and a countercurrent multiplier, we can summarize the major effects. That is, if you have a countercurrent exchanger working, its main function is going to be maintaining gradients. You can see that because the gradient differences between the two tubules in this example is only very small. On the other hand, a countercurrent multiplier will create gradients. So immediately you can see here, if you're thinking about what is the origin of the hyperosmotic medullary interstitium, you realize that that's going to be caused by a countercurrent multiplier and not by a countercurrent exchanger. The countercurrent exchanger, which we will not be discussing in this uh, video, is typical found in the vasa recta of the kidney where their main function is to preserve the hyperosmotic medium which has been created by the uh, countercurrent multiplier. With that background we can now continue with our discussion of the mechanisms that makes a hyperosmotic medullary fluid. First of all, it's a function of juxtamedullary nephrons, and in particular, it is a function of the fact that the different segments of the loop each has a different permeability to sodium and to water. So here we have a diagram of such a loop of Henley. It is a countercurrent system with a descending limb going from the cortex down into the medulla and then in turn there is an ascending limb the countercurrent flow which runs from the medulla back into the cortex. Now each segment each of these three major segments will have different properties that is so vital for making a hyperosmotic fluid. We start off with the fact that the filtrate from the glomerulus that flows into the loop of Henle is going to be isosmotic, as is the, tubule, uh, the fluid of the cortex itself. The descending limb of Henle is, has a very high water permeability, but it also has a very low solute permeability, which means that water can go out of the tubule leaving the salts behind and this is going to make the tubular fluid in the descending limb very concentrated. The thin ascending limb of Henley is much different. It has a very low water permeability, keeps the water inside the tubule, but it has a high permeability to sodium chloride. The important issue here is that this permeability is governed by passive mechanisms. We're still not quite sure about how sodium chloride can leave the cell. It could be that it leaves the cells uh, via the tight junctions, but we just simply do not know, and it is not important at this stage. It's more important to remember what the, the properties are. The major role player lies in the outer medulla. I'd like to refer you to this uh, diagram you have here. It's a graphic representation of the changes in the osmolality of the tubular fluid all along the nephron. In my opinion, this is a very important diagram and should help students a lot to understand the concentrating ability of the kidney. Unfortunately, I don't think that students often pay enough attention to a, a graph as simple as this one. But what we can see here first of all is that coming into the loop of Henle 
the fluid is going to be ice osmolar, an osmolality of approximately 300 milliosmoles. As we've described in the previous figure, in the descending limb, the fluid will become hyperosmotic, and then as it goes along the ascending limb, that is when it becomes diluted. And when the fluid flows into the distal convoluted tubule and the early collecting duct, then in fact your urine is diluted. What this also tells you is that, in a manner of speaking, the default uh, mechanism of the kidney is to make a diluted urine. It is only when you make a concentrated urine, which happens, as you can see here, in the, especially in the medullary collecting ducts, where you will produce a concentrated urine, and only if ADH is present.